Hi, this is my favorite writers and I'm Abigail Sartellen. I'm here with Dean Bakopoulos. Is that how I pronounce your last name? That's a, that's a British pronunciation. It's Bakopoulos. But, Bakopoulos. But oh I like the- God. I've been reading you for years and I've always pronounced it that way because I've never met you in real life or maybe I've never I'm, heard your name. I'm serious, all, all British people pronounce it that way the first time. So I think there's- <laughs> Cool, there's an okay, well. Good. I'm glad I, I, I'm coming across British because obviously I'm yes. pretending to be. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm just going to show everybody your books because I do actually have them here. We just moved and wow. um, moved without many books, but I do have yours. This one has been read so many times. <laughs> Everything's falling apart and it has a big stain on the front cover. But this no. was, I think I first saw this in a um, best book covers of, was it 2012 uh, or 13? It was 12, was it? Or 11, well, I think it was 11. 11 for the hardcover year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I also have this one. So with, with Baby Dean, <laughs> I will ask you about in a minute. Um, but where are you right now and what are you doing? I know you're, you teach, are you, on, mm -hmm. are you teaching or no? Um, we're on summer vacation, I'm in, in um, Iowa. Um, currently at my house in Grinnell, um, I also have a Place I ran outside of Iowa City, so I, I'm I'm, I'm uh, at my house on campus in Grinnell. The campus is totally empty, um, and it's it's nice not to be teaching. But I think, you know, given given how strange the world has gotten um, in the last few years, and especially in the last few weeks, um, I miss teaching in a way that I didn't when I was younger. I think it's it's it makes me feel like I'm making a difference. I'm and I. I can mentor an amazingly curious, diverse group of students. And uh, so as much as I love the time to write and the time to spend with my kids, um, my, my two, two kids are with me. Um, I, do, I do miss teaching for the first summer ever. Usually when it's summer, it's like, oh good, nobody needs anything from me. But I, I had a <laughs> special group this year and our, our semester got cut short. And so um, I love being on summer break, but definitely, Given the state of the world, um, I kind of wish wish I would I had that grounding in my life, the teaching part. But no complaints. A summer off is something I haven't had very much in my life, so I'll do something with it. And I uh, do not. Uh, so I have been around the outskirts of America as mm -hmm. a book tour. I've done the book tour arch, um, but I've never been to. Is it Iowa? Mm -hmm. How you pronounce it? Okay, I was going yeah. Iowa. Um, so I've never been to Iowa, and but I I think it is a is it a majority white state? Am I yes. guessing that? And so are, the, are there people that you are teaching majority white? And if so, like, do you speak about black history mm -hmm. and black writing? And how do you how do you teach that? Well, we you know I'm at Grinnell College, which is um, a little elite liberal arts college with um, an amazing financial aid program and a, it recruits all over the world. So we have students from all over the world here and all states and it's, I think this year's incoming class was over 50%. Um, if, you, if you count all students, it was close to 50% students of color. So it's, Iowa is very white and old, but Grinnell campus is quite diverse and young. Um, and uh, we do, you know, I, I've, as I've grown as a teacher, just adding diversity to the, the syllabus to my reading list, issues of race are, are constantly bringing, coming into the creative writing classroom. And I think I've learned how to be a better mentor to a more diverse group of students. I, I think, I guess the example I have is, um, I always think of myself as this really approachable guy and really nice guy and a pretty you know, laid back for a professor. Um, and, and then it occurred to me, one of my colleagues brought this up to me maybe four or five years ago, and I really appreciated her kind of challenging me on this, is you're still a white bearded dude to them. You know, like they don't, they've been grown, our, our black students, our students of color haven't grown up trusting people like you or feeling comfortable asking you to meet maybe. So I learned to just realize that it's not enough just to be nice. Um, but to, to really make sure you are looking at the diversity in body and like wh who, who is not speaking in class, who does not come to office hours 
and is there something I can do? It was a very simple attitudinal change, but I, I uh, have to thank a lot of our, our visiting writers, black writers and black, my black colleagues in the department um, who've, who've taken on the unfair labor of teaching people like me how to be a better mentor to more people. So um, it's a very diverse student body and I think I'm learning how to be a better teacher to a more diverse group of students. Um, and that gives me hope that more people will, will start to do the work we need to do in this country. Um, we all have a lot, long way to go, but this, this week has been, the last few weeks have been pretty horrific in America, so. Are there um, protests where you are? I know I, I listen to Maddow religiously, and so I was, uh, she was saying that, you know, there are huge protests obviously in Minneapolis and New York City, but um, she was talking about there was a, a town in Alabama that's 97% white and 500 people showed up to protest. Um, yeah, we, uh, go on, sorry. Oh, no, we've had, we've had big protests in Iowa City the last two nights. The first night, the police uh, tear gassed the protesters. It was pretty horrific. The second night, last night of protest, the mayor of Iowa City um, came out and let, started the protest. Uh, he's African-American and just kind of set the tone. And, and I, I'm imagining behind the scenes also did some corrective work on the city police. It's a small enough town where um, that should not have happened. So last night in Iowa City, they shut down Interstate 80, which is a major artery through North America. So um, they closed the interstate with the protest and the police were much more cooperative and less brutal last night um, with the protest. But it, it's difficult. I mean, there are, you know, when you protest in small, in big cities, there's, there's challenges in big cities. In small towns, you often have white supremacists driving around in pickup trucks waving Confederate flags and shouting at you. And they're usually armed and it, it's, it's scary. Uh, uh, so big shout out to the protesters in Iowa City last night who, I was in Grinnell, so I was about an hour away, but it's, it's near my, my apartment there. Um, and uh, I will say that they were fearless. They, they were, not only was there pickup trucks, a small contingent of pickup trucks, flying Confederate flags and, and taunting the protesters. Um, there was also, you know, the aftermath of a, a pretty brutal night the police had the first night. And more protesters than ever showed up and marched completely fearlessly, mostly young people, people of all ages, but young people were fearless. They were not going to be intimidated. And um, I don't know if I would have had that courage as a college student, but I will say that the students in Iowa City with the University of Iowa is um, really led an amazing couple days of protests. My last guest uh, um, was, which came out today, the day we're recording, um, was Sahar Dalajani, um, who, who was born in Evan prison because her mother protested the um, Islamic regime in Iran and was thrown in prison. Um, so Sahar was born there. And I, it, it just makes me think like, how connected people are really and mm -hmm. how um you know s the stories of oh man it's just it's it just like it it shakes me to the core what's going on in the states at the moment and that you have um trump as your leader and i'm hoping that november will bring you guys some something of a a new dawn um but I'm I'm worried, <laughs> and and how hopefully are you. I mean, it's it's weird. The, the strange, the strangest of growing up, you know, like both of my both of my parents are immigrants, and my my grandparents on my mom's side were in Nazi labor camps. My mother was born in a refugee camp and lived there for the first five years of her life. My father came to the U.S. from Greece during the military coup of '67. Um, landing in Detroit really right when the the riots of 67 were starting in Detroit and so these ideas of the horrible fascist regimes and um, military upheaval and militarized police force have been such a part of my family lore but they've been so distant you know I you know I grew up hearing stories on both sides of like the brutalities of fascist regimes, um, of Stalinism, of, of the fascists, you know, in Europe at the end of the war. So it's such a part of my, you know, 
Yeah, I was very young when I would hear stories of my, you know, grand, grandparents talking about their siblings being murdered by Stalinist police forces. Um, so to now see it in my country where it seemed like almost this mythical thing, but you know, it's a, it's a very brutal, brutal way of policing that's been enabled from the, the leader of the country. And it's, I don't want to sound like a naive white American, but I think I was, I was like, it's bad, but it would never happen like that here. But I think it is happening here. Um, members of the black community have been telling us this for 40 years. Like, Eventually, the fascism comes for everybody. They've lived with it um, through so much, of, through every step of their history and struggle against it. But I think one reason I think the protests are so diverse and in terms of age and, and gender and um, culture is that we realize, you know, finally we are waking up and being like, it's, it's come for everybody. And we should have stopped it when it was coming just for certain people. When, you know, when children were being, um, brutalized trying to go to school in the 60s, you know, when, when the Jim Crow of South was was raging. These are times we should have stopped it. So it's both chilling and also, I think, shameful for a lot of white Americans that we didn't pay attention till we had the visceral video clips, till we, we saw it with our own eyes. But um, maybe that's what did it. Maybe it was the constant videos being shared of, of a militarized police force brutalizing citizens. It's, it's very, very heavy time here. Um, yeah. And I'm pretty insulated from it, you know, in Iowa right now, but it's there's definitely protests here and there's definitely people affected by it. So. I remember reading uh, essay Tamil Curran's How to Lose a Country. Mm -hmm. And um, she's a Turkish writer and she's talking about um, the the kind of loss of democracy that they've been seeing over the past few years and she goes around the uk and the us um meeting fairly middle class people and giving these speeches and um she says everywhere she goes people say oh my god that's terrible how can we help you and she's saying no you don't understand i'm here to help you <laughs> because you are going in the same direction and uh you know she says no one ever quite gets it. Um, and maybe uh, as the Reverend Al Sharpton said uh, last night, I think at the, at the memorial for George Lloyd, um, maybe the time, time's up, now it's time, or time's out, as you put it. The, that kind yeah. of, like, oh, it's not really happening to us, thinking. Um, yeah. So let's talk about your writing. Um, I, firstly, I want to know um, about uh, Baby Dean. This is a question I ask everyone. Uh, and how you, when did you first start writing? Were you like a five-year-old or, did, you know, did you join uh, your school magazine when you were like 15? How did that happen for you? It was, it was pretty early. It was one of those, as soon as I learned to read, I wanted to write. Um, and so I remember very vividly being I had a wonderful second grade teacher named Mrs. Dixon, who had created writing every day and part of this thing called workshop. You do these little stations of, in the day and creative writing was my favorite part of the day. And I, I'll never forget being on the little rug and she sometimes would read people's creative writing stories and she read mine out loud, probably a paragraph long. <laughs> it was called, I Get Trapped. It was about <laughs> being trapped. And, and I was a, 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 a kind of superhero with the Detroit Pistons basketball team because I was obsessed with sports as a young man and as a young boy. And like, anyway, I remember her reading this very terrible story out loud, but just being thrilled when I heard my classmates laugh. <laughs> like, um, I was hooked really early. I, I, you know, I thought of other professions that were maybe more respectful or safe every so often, but really it never, it never wavered. I was going to, I was going to write. So yeah, kind of one of those obnoxious people who knew right away what they wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to say for um, people watching that occasionally I, you know, we, we all have like internet problems at home during lockdown and occasionally Dean's voice is not quite uh, catching up with the video, but then it seems to catch up again. So I think we'll just continue and also, when it's released in a podcast, people won't know apart from me saying this. So, <laughs> um, 
So I had a little list of questions that I wanted to ask you. And um, my family's been sending me WhatsApp pictures of my nieces, so they're just completely there. Um, right, I wanted to talk to you about adaptations because mm -hmm. you co-wrote the screenplay to mm -hmm. your debut novel, Please Don't Come mm -hmm. Back to the Moon. And um, it was such a dreamy story and, and, and pretty introspective. Um, but it, it did feel to me like an independent film, but now because I've spent the past couple of years adapting Golden Boy um, into a feature script, I know that's not easy. So how did you take this like very reflective internal story and translate that to something very visual? Yeah, you know, I, I have adapted it so many times for major studios. So I adapted it for TV for Lionsgate and that nothing happened way back in 2010. I've adapted it for Universal and nothing happened. Um, and it'd been around the studios a lot. And then it was, um, when it was brought to me as an independent project by James Franco, I just, at that point I was like, I don't know if this is gonna be, he had read the book, wanted to do the movie. And it had been through so many people. I said, you know, I'll do it, but I wanna write the script because I wanna learn how to write and adapt the script. So I wrote a script and then sort of everyone with the project went AWOL and I just didn't hear anything. And I wrote, you know, they liked the script and they were, that was it. Um, and then all of a sudden I got a note that they were starting production. So like, <laughs> and there was with a deeply um, changed script and I didn't like the script. Um, someone else had rewritten it. And then, and I was just very blunt with, with James and said, I don't like this script at all. So he, he went back to my original script, but they didn't have the money to shoot in Detroit and to do a huge um, show. Rashida Jones came on, but she needed to be in California and it was not a paying, well-paying gig, so she couldn't give up months of her life for it. So um, the director, Bruce Kiri Chung, who really made, I think made the film into something with almost no money, um, is really who gets the credit for how beautifully shot the film is. Um, the script, there's a lot of scenes that they couldn't do and there's a lot of parts in the script I wrote where there were holes in it so I don't know so much if like adaptation really comes through in the in the film version which is called don't come back from the moon and I believe it's on Amazon Prime still people want to watch it but um, Bruce did a, a beautiful job and his, his partner was a cinematographer and she did this amazing work um, they turned it into like a, a visual mood piece and they kept what they could from the script. But what I loved about that process and Bruce brought me back into the process when he came on as director, um, really talented, you know, sweet, intel intelligent guy, just really fun to collaborate with. Um, he just, it was, he's like, we have money for a mood piece basically. And we're going to try to capture, you know, the book is about a, a, a community, where a group of fathers sort of abdicates responsibility for their lives in mass and they walk away. Um, and I think he really captured that visually in a way that, you know, I wouldn't have seen. So the visuals are all him. Uh, he had to change location from the script and everything. Um, and then I came in late and, and tried to fix some things in the edits with him and was, had some voiceover, which I think gave it more of a, a connected feel. And then, Johnny Jewell came in and did a wonderful score. He's a composer I really love. Um, you know, people probably know his work with the chromatics and he just really put a mu music and the visuals really make the film. So I can't really take credit for the adaptation as much as my name. My name is on it and I love the credit, but um, you know, the, a lot of the scenes were improvised. A lot of the actors were locals who were working, you know, um, in their first movie ever. <laughs> um, and so what I loved about the process was how collaborative it is. And it was really just about the art. No one was making money on this film. Nobody was um, too invested in like sticking to a script or a book. It was like, let's just use what we have and make a film. And they made it very quickly. The editor um, you know, did wonderful work. I thought he, the way that the, editor took that footage and blanking on his name is Joe, but I can't remember his last name, but you should, you can see it in the credits, but like all those people made the film. And so that's why I love the film. It's not that it was a great script necessarily and, or even like a faithful adaptation, 
um, but the acting, the the music, um, the visuals, it just the locals, the local community um, that came out to be part of the film just made it special. So when you work alone as a writer all the time, to have that many people help you do something, that, that was what was thrilling for me. And that's what I love best about TV and film. When it's working, the collaboration is so fun. I was just about to say, I, I thought maybe you wouldn't have that because of teaching, but for me, the nice thing about working on a film has been like, I get to see people. <laughs> I, I'm like, oh yeah, I have a colleague. And, you know, we have lunch together. And I, I think, you know, I hope the film gets made, but I really appreciated all those lunches and the conversations. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and working with a director as well that is so talented and interesting and has so many ideas. Just completely different from sitting there. And did you and adapt? I, did you adapt? Yes, I, um, I, the audio cut out, but I, I think you asked if I adapted the script, um, the book, sorry. Um, yes, so far. Um, so I've done, the, it, in the, the BBC they do like an initial draft and then you'll have your producer's drafts within that. So I did two producer's drafts and then uh, we had a second draft, which was like, I think four or five drafts. And uh, we, we were, I think maybe a little bit unsure about what exactly we wanted it to be at a certain point we had we had pitched um a little bit like boys don't cry meets glee and and then i think there was some discussion about actually you know how much of the glee part we were going to have or you know where we exactly we wanted to set it and and who we wanted to be in the film we've lost some of the characters in the book and um, obviously it's so much shorter so um, I've, I've adapted it so far. They seem happy with it. They just approved the next round of funding. <laughs> we'll see. It's um, with them, um, the director's gonna take a crack at it now. And um, I think she, she, my feeling is that I just don't think visually in the same way that she thinks. And I just don't know what kind of, how you tell a story with a camera i don't have i can i can learn i can read about it but i don't have that feel for it that she does because she's been working in ads and short films for so long um so i'm really excited to see what happens so um now i'm going to ask you about your other screenwriting project um so scott newstadter who did 500 days of summer once told me that he and his screenwriting partner michael h weber they pass scripts back and forth so he'll do a draft he'll pass it over um i also know writers who allocate like you'll do the odd scene numbers you'll do the evens or like i'm going to take these two sequences and you're going to do that so you are writing currently with your wife Alyssa nutting who i'm also a huge fan of because i just loved tampa <laughs> Um, and I, so you're adapting her second novel, but third book, yeah, um, Made for Love in, into a series for HBO Max, is that right? Yep. Yep. And so what's your process when you write together and has it, did you, have you, is it always been the same or has it evolved? Um, it's evolved, it's changed a lot. I think when we first started working on Made for Love, we did that passing the script back and forth. Um, but television, once, once they bring in a showrunner and, and networks and producers and a writer's room, it became more, we were just part of this crew and it was really more Alyssa's project as it went on. I think, um, you know, I was part of the room and stuff, but she really worked on it more than I did once we got the pilot sold. Um, so I was really heavily involved in the first three episodes maybe, but really what, what came out of it. Um, is more her vision and also you know it's nobody's vision in a way because there's so many cooks in the kitchen with TV yeah. um, there's it's one of the things I think TV is often ends up being a product of compromises and um, so you know I think one thing we learned from it is how hard it is to work together for us actually like we we had a pretty <laughs> rough, I think that us us being in LA and working together and learning something new, it was just very stressful. And I think one of the things, you know, um, that we learned is that like, 
right now for us, we're working on a feature together. Um, but in general, like writing might be something we're better at separately, <laughs> 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 which I know is not a great loving it, you know, a romantic answer, but it was the truth. I think it was, it was tough for us to both be working on the same show when neither of us had a lot of power. Um, and so we're very different writers. Um, and, and I think one thing that's been interesting for us is that like, just because you click in every other way, you click physically and emotionally and spiritually, you may not click creatively. Um, in the same way. And I think we were sort of surprised by that. But it was, yeah. it was actually a great experience for us as a couple. It's hard. There were definitely some dark nights of the soul, but I think we, we came through it stronger. Um, because when you're working on something together, it brings, especially we're writing, you know, a screenplay about marriage and we're married together. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're, we're do everything together at that point where we raise our kids and live together. And, and um, I mean, it was intense. It was very intense. I don't know if, I don't know if it was a positive experience creatively, but it, I think we became a stronger couple and better people because of it. Yeah. But it's not the answer people expect. <laughs> you know, so many writer couples are like, oh, it's so fun. And he's my best friend. I don't think we were each other's best friends when we were trying to work together. <laughs> <laughs> we were, we, I'll we really come home and be like, oh, this is really annoying person at my work. Right. Ew. <laughs> well, I think, you know, we're both sensitive people too. So like disapproval from other people, no big deal, you know, it's part of the game. But when your spouse doesn't like your idea or when your spouse, you feel like your spouse isn't including you in the conversation, you know, or whatever. Um, yeah. You know, LA, LA is great. I love so much about it, but there's terrible people there too. And I think <laughs> learning, learning that I'm not going to, you know, always love love the process is also good if i'm gonna do film and tv there's just gonna be um people i clash with and you know i like to run from conflict but tv and film has more conflict than fiction right <laughs> I think. yeah for sure yeah when you're on your own i mean i always think i'm a very agreeable person but then i right. spend all day on my own agreeing with myself <laughs> and then and then i you know get into a relationship and um i think you know i may okay maybe maybe i do hold my hand up i i do do some things wrong <laughs> um that's really that's super interesting um and i yeah i'm gonna i think i had something to say but i've totally forgotten that these are very but okay so now i'm gonna ask you about your your book writing <laughs> and um i i mean i think that you know that um I, I love My American Unhappiness so much. I think it's such a funny book. And I also definitely told you on Twitter, but this was a while ago, that it was so odd because I read um, My American Unhappiness and the character Zeke, the protagonist, reminded me so much of my then partner. Um, oh. was for a while, a, a good, he's a great human, but we didn't end up together. And then when I read Tampa, um, and he'd read it as well. We were like, oh, this, you know, if I could write any book, it would have been this book. It's such a great book. And I felt like that book was so me and this book was so him. And then you guys got married. <laughs> and that was really weird for me. Um, well, it's funny. It's Alyssa's favorite book of mine. And I remember when I read Tampa, I didn't know Alyssa at the time. Um, but I remember reading it. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I was obviously smitten by her cute author photo, but I was also had this weird thought. I'm like, this is actually a novel, partly about an unhappy marriage. But of course, critics were not looking at it like that. Yeah. But it felt like, to me, it's like, this is, as is my American unhappiness. I think they're both books about, you know, being unhappy in love and desire. I mean, Tampa being a much, much, much more warped, predatory version of that. But yeah. they're both. They're both so funny, but they're covering up a ton of suffering, you know? I, I kind of think that, the, yeah, I agree with you. And I also, I think that the books, the way that we talked about them, and myself and my then partner, was that they were quite compatible books, I think. They're, mm -hmm. they're so different. I mean, um, this is a very, 
it's really, I guess it's really, I find it really funny and pithy and it's, I feel like a very sensitive book about a guy who feels too much in a way, like just falls in love with men at Starbucks, He's just in love. <laughs> and, and he's not really getting anything right. And then there's this woman in Tampa who, the narrative feels to me like she knows exactly what she wants and she's gunning for it <laughs> at, at, at such a, with, without any sensitivity. And I, I, I don't know, it, it felt like, I mean, they kind of, it felt like they worked together in, a, in the way that we worked together. And um, yeah, I mean, I love them both and they're such different books. I'm trying to find a bit in here because I wanted to ask you about writing about the Midwest because you do so in all of your books. Mm -hmm. And I, I so rarely read books actually set in the Midwest, but then um, Zeke talks about, and I had it open, but I closed it to, you, you know, look at the, <laughs> show you the cover a minute ago. Um, but in the book, he has this project called, um, is it called My American Unhappiness or it's called The Unhappiness Project or? Yeah, Inventory of American Unhappiness, I think is what it's called. That's it. And he talks about how it got funded by the Great Midwestern Humanities Initiative. Yes. And um, this was, I'm just gonna read this a little bit. The, the founders of the Great Midwestern Humanities Initiative including a gaggle of congressional leaders led by Wisconsin Republican Quince Leatherberry, an anti-immigration conservative from the state's wealthy fifth district, who despite his constant sermons on self-reliance and hard work has never held a job outside of Capitol Hill and has lived largely on the fat of his father's land. Leatherberry, an unlikely ally for public humanities funding was joined by H.M. Logan, a business leader and chair of GMHI, as well as an odd alliance of advocates, vigorously paid lobbyists and oft bewildered but generous businessmen who believe that in order to slow our regional brain drain, young Midwesterners simply needed to know the hallowed heritage of their homeland to read the rich literature of their own region and to understand the blessed uniqueness of their landscape and culture, then they might stay. And you talk about the sons and daughters of Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, Ohio, Nebraska, uh, Willa Cather, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Sinclair Lewis, and then some musicians. And um, that really struck me. I, I'm from both sides of my family. I'm from uh, like a manufacturing working class background, um, Irish immigrants who came to work in the car factories in our Detroit area, <laughs> our car factory area, and then um, people who worked in the fishing industry. And I read that paragraph and I thought, oh my God, you're right. There used to be people who kind of came from these backgrounds and, and wrote about their experiences. And um, I, I so rarely read books like that now. And so I wonder, like, I guess my question is, why do you write about the Midwest? And does it have anything to do with that sentiment that you express in, you know, kind of a satirical way. <laughs> but. I mean, that was one of the first parts of the book I wrote, and it was after a meeting with a Wisconsin congressperson, Joe Sensenbrenner, who, who was a horribly hawkish, anti-immigrant uh, conservative who was born rich, never held a day job in his life. And he was, I was there lobbying on behalf of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and he was so rude and dismissive that that really was the start of the book. I started this book in a hotel room in Washington, D.C., uh, drinking scotch and, and angry. Um, and, and I loved the, I love rhetoric. I love when, I love, I, I'm really good. I used to do freelance work at like writing mission statements for organizations and corporate groups and stuff. Um, I love the rhetoric we put into the things we want to fund. It's such an amazing skill. Um, and this whole country is sort of built on the delusions of, of our rhetoric that don't match the reality. And so I, I kind of was having fun in that passage of like, it really isn't about reading F. Scott Fitzgerald <laughs> and Willa Cather. Um, it's about economic justice and the social decline of, of you know, the safety net and race relations. And, um, but we could convince ourselves that, you know, 
the arts and humanities can save us. And I think what I wanted to, to do in this book is talk about the unsustainability of the rhetoric on both the right and the left in this country, this optimistic rhetoric that really isn't backed by action or reality. And I started the book during the recession of 2008, in which I went totally broke with a three-year-old and a one-year-old, um, and, and it was unemployed. <clears throat> and uh, so there's a lot of anger in the book. It's, the book ends with Barack Obama's election, which I was you know, cheered and I loved that Obama won, but I also knew that it was more rhetoric and it was, would we really be able to make lasting change? And I think now re reading that end of that book, which takes place in Chicago in November of 2008, and then we didn't make lasting change. You know, I think he was a great president, but I think so much of it was rhetoric <laughs> as we see now. You know, also, so it's so easy to pick apart a democracy if you yeah. elect or not quite elect, but he wins the vote, he wins it anyway. <laughs> Um, you know, if you elect the, the wrong person and um, it's so easy to pull everything apart. I can't believe like how many, you know, people in whole, um, like, is it the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency? I was reading about how that's been like literally torn apart and, you know, just vacancies not filled and yeah. everything. Yeah. So, yes, it's it's interesting because I think this book obviously it's about that time and the, the run up to Obama's election, but it feels so relevant now because it's yeah. <laughs> sad in a way. And um, the, the project about unhappiness, everybody writes in to say <laughs> what makes them unhappy. And there's this kind of like throughout the book, there's a, and I felt this about the project as well, is that I both found it enriching enriching to to read these um what people write in about about their own unhappiness but then also in the book there's the kind of suggestion that how is this helping <laughs> as well <laughs> like um and people put it to zeke what what yeah. is it supposed to be doing you know so yeah. i love that too um thank you um. so much for Oh, sorry, did you want to say something? Please do. Oh, no, I just realized I had another meeting that's buzzing that was supposed to be I, Yeah, Zoom. We, I, we've gone on, and uh, that's my fault. So I'm thank you so much for... I, I really was a nice break in scrolling through Twitter mindlessly. And <laughs> yeah. Um, can I ask you, before you go, would you recommend a book that you are either reading or have read recently, and maybe another writer for me to read that I might have on the the show on my little thing at some point oh um you know the the book that i think blew me away most in the last few years was ksa layman's heavy a non-fiction book a memoir which is formally inventive but so um crucial to understanding the, the plight of particularly of black men in america um in a way that is so intelligent in its both its construction and its sentences, but also in how it it takes down so much of our culture. Um, but also, it's a beautiful takedown of, of the author of his own self. It's a, um, it's a hugely vulnerable book. I, I I admire it so much because when I first heard him read from it, he came to Cornell College and read from it before it was published. And Kiese was you know up there, and I've never been to a reading where so many people were spellbound and shook and trying to stand up after the reading was challenging. I mean, it, it is, a, I think, the most powerful book of the last few years. And it got a ton of attention. I'm not, pretty, it's not a, a sleeper. Um, a lot of people have read it, but uh, if, if you haven't, you know, from the sentences to the social implications, it's, it's a genius on all levels. Thank you. And then a writer to have on the show, um, is that, was that the other question? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, yes, it would be great, but he's probably very busy. <laughs> um, I think a poet that I love and is a dear friend of mine is Gabrielle Calacarezzi, Gabby. Um, Gabby's most recent work in The New Yorker um, is, is like a new form of poetry. I, I, I'm obsessed with her poetry. It's taught me so much about fiction 
Um, and I can't even explain it, but if you go to the New Yorker and you look for Gabriel Calva Perezzi, I think all readers should, you know, I think fiction writers can learn a lot from how she throws this surreal into her poems, but they're still emotionally gutting. Um, I, she writes so profoundly about mental illness and d depression and um, feelings of powerlessness and social people that definitely worth looking at. Amazing. Thank you so much. Will you um, message me her last name? I will. Have it, yeah. <laughs> okay. And I will share both those writers in the post. Thank you so much for taking the time. This was so nice and really good to meet you in person. And uh, thank, you. thank you very much for reading my book back in the, back in the day and, and giving me some beautiful words to put on it as well. That's really kind. Yes, of course. It was a pleasure. Okay. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye. Well. Bye.